Right. Hello and welcome everybody once again back to the wonderful Rochester Parkour Gym. We've got things set up a little bit differently for today. We're going to be doing kind of like a talking... Chatting it up. Yeah, a, a talking head style video for, for today after our little mini break this weekend. Yep. A little, little vacation. Hopefully you had a good time as well. For those of you that were able to come by and pick up your balance trainers, hopefully those those got some use over the weekend and you were able to move around and do some good fun stuff. As always, we are streaming through Facebook as well as YouTube, so feel free to join us on whatever platform feels best. We are monitoring chat, so feel free to say hi or, I don't know, just otherwise be, be cool people. You could also just be a lurker as well, and, and that's fine as well. <laughs> there's a lot of those. <laughs> but there's a lot of those. Uh, so, couple couple things. What something that we've been meaning to do that we haven't necessarily done in a little bit, and today we wanted to use the opportunity to do is sort of use this as an educational tool to help you understand not just ju not just following what we tell you to do. However, it's very humbling that sometimes we we get to as instructors and teachers we say do this and then you all do it yeah. which is cool right that's fun but uh sometimes it's also nice to to be able to gain the understanding as to what is it that we are doing when we craft workouts and how can you let's say in the future if we were to set up a strength class and say we're going to be running this exercise or we're going to be doing this many reps or whatever when we do that that's based on a very generic person that that may or may not exist in the sense of if we say that we're going to do 10 reps of something there are very real reasons why you might decide not to do 10 reps of something granted we're telling you to do 10 reps of something but again, once you gain the understanding as to what you're trying to do and what you're looking for and where you want to take your specific adaptations, whichever ones you're looking for, you can tailor our exercises and our sets and workouts for something that better fits you. And you can kind of take control and be the master of your own destiny. Woohoo! if you so choose. <laughs> so with that in mind, we're just going to explain and do a very generic rundown of, of why we do the kind of workouts that we do, what we're looking for when we're crafting exercises, and what things create different types of adaptations. So with Charlie, that... what? explain what an adaptation is. An adaptation, we are always adapting to the stressors in our life. Cool. Sound familiar? <laughs> yes, I know, right? Yeah, we are we, we are literally adapting right now by being online and, <laughs> and not being or not letting you be here physically and that's okay. okay. That's alright. We do miss you all though. Yeah. We, we miss you. We we hope that you're staying safe and, and being awesome and wonderful and whatnot and yeah, being cool, fun people. It's However, fuzzy. yeah, it's really liking his. Best it's a, it's a very. My face. <laughs> I don't know what that's called. It's like a, a shallow focal. It's uh, fine. It's a, yeah. <laughs> Keep going. I think it's a shallow focal <laughs> length or something like that. But uh, <laughs> just to to say, if. There, there are very real things as to why you might want specific adaptations. What is an adaptation? If you're looking to gain strength, that is an adaptation. If you are looking to lose weight, adaptation. Gain weight, adaptation. Uh, get get more more, more VO2 max and, and be able to like handle your oxygen better. That is an adaptation. These are all things that you can customize for yourself for whatever particular reason you're looking for. If you are attempting to complete your first marathon, 
you're going to train differently. very differently yeah. than somebody that is trying to, I don't know, compete in their first powerlifting competition. They're, they're two very opposite ends of the spectrum. And again, there are reasons why some, some of you might want Joel, one thing and another thing. Joel says adaptation is his middle name. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> this we knew. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Right. Uh, Did you, I don't think Charlie saw your setup on in your home with your two bar trainers. I have that not. Made me very nervous. Yeah, I have not. He had them going from his co from the ground to the coffee table. I can handle that. From the coffee table to his bar stool. Oh. <laughs> That's a recipe for amazing. Don't try this at home, folks. I need a video. <laughs> Yen, Show us a video. Yen says, video. do we know ahead of time when these events occur? Yeah, Yen's, uh, we always have it posted on the website. So if you go to rochesterparkour.com and hit live, we always are shooting to stream Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, Sunday at about 2, thir Tuesday, Thursday at 5.30. But you'll always see the next one scheduled ahead of time on listed on the live page when you scroll down below the uh, first video. It will always say it, and I always update it. The least amount of time that it's updated is immediately after we're done streaming. So like today, when we are done streaming, it will take me a few hours because I have to wait for it to render, and then I try my best to update it quickly. Yeah. So. Yes, back to adaptation. Back to adaptation. Uh, in, in the beginning. Hi, David. Yeah, in the beginning, <laughs> there, there will definitely, you will be able to gain all three of those things. You can get stronger. You can get swole, if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> and you can lose weight and increase your cardiovascular system all together because you have so much room for improvement in the beginning stages. However, as you start to become more and more specialized, as you start to become better and better and adapt farther and farther, the law of diminishing returns takes over and you will need to focus on specific things. And that's what we're gonna be kind of focusing our stream on today. What kind of things do you want to specifically customize to allow you to get the type of adaptations that you're going for? With that in mind, let's do a little biology class real quick and just explain why you might get, let's say, tired under different circumstances or, or different workouts. Anyone, I don't care who you are, anyone can become tired after a workout. That just is what it is. The, I was typing. That's Sorry. okay, yeah. The, 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 the tiredness of you does not relate to the success of your goal, which is to say somebody off the street can be like, hey, do a thousand push-ups. And, no. if, and if your goal is to blow off your tendons, then you've then succeeded. Then that's an excellent choice for that act of adaptation. <laughs> then you've succeeded. <laughs> uh, but if your goal is to increase your your muscular or pressing power, a thousand push-ups won't help you, except for the fact that you know you did a thousand. Sure, you would you did a lot of that same action. There are some adaptations that you might get from that that can cross translate into the power spectrum, but aren't necessarily really helping you get yourself to there. The, 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 like whether or not you feel tired or sore the next day has no relation here. Uh, anybody can be tired after a workout. Yeah. That's, exactly. that, yeah. But also soreness typically novelty. Correct. Yeah. And typically when you're training for specific adaptations, at some point in time, your body has become accustomed to the types of exercises that you're doing on, on a semi-regular basis. And the soreness itself goes away. As a trainer, we are kind of looking to achieve that because muscular soreness ends up taking away from a, a student's ability to train during the next workout. 
Soreness isn't necessarily debilitating. Soreness is just kind of unfortunate. It's, it's, uh... uh depends on your perspective. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 um... I it's, can understand relating to wanting to feel sore to feel like you've been successful, but that's the whole point of this conversation is to show that just because you're, or if you're not sore, does not mean you did not do something valuable for the adaptation you're Correct. But what soreness could equate to is poor performance in your next workout session, thus you stop progressing at the same rate. And that can become a, that can create plateaus in and of itself. You become too sore, you can't perform during the next workout. True. You're not able to continue doing good fun stuff. Or that it could be stuff. a deterrent. Right. Right. Uh, any anybody can anybody can feel soreness at any point in time. There, there's no extremely understood rhyme or reason, but novelty and eccentric exercises basically a strengthening while lengthening. Yeah, there you go. I was gonna yeah. say Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he uses big words, I'm 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 ready to chime in for what, everybody's what help. What is eccentric? <laughs> what is eccentric, Charlie? <laughs> Other than me. Bold. <laughs> Get, Bold. It. Get it? Bold. It was a funny joke. So if I flex <laughs> my bicep, if I'm out here and then pull her in, this is a <laughs> concentric motion. But if I were to resist as she pulls me back, this is eccentric, and now I'm going to be deadly sore tomorrow. <laughs> oh. Just right there. It'll be okay. Oh. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so. Oh, Yen says back on the the soreness. It all depends on how masochistic you are. This is true. Some <laughs> people just really like soreness. And if, if you really like soreness, then that is also an adaptation that sure. you can strive for. Mm -hmm. And you can just shoot for doing tons of novel things all the time and make yourself sore. Yeah. So cool. Uh, for instance, you can do a lot of, of strength training. You can be a very strong, powerful individual, but if you have not rock climbed in a really long time and then you go for a rock climbing session you're going to be sore even if you you can do like rows till the day comes home or the cows come home i don't know what <laughs> the, the day till till the, the day, day ends I, don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I know words <laughs> <laughs> uh uh you are likely to feel sore and it's not that climbing is a joel has a lot of middle names of course he does Soreness is one of them. So, now. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> it's not that climbing is a better workout for you, although it probably will be more fun. But you know, whatever. Uh, it's not that it's a better workout for you. That depends on whether or not it's pertinent to your goals. But it's not better just because it made you sore. Anything that's new can make you sore. Keep that in mind. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Joel's just being snarky. <laughs> He's just, he's just keeping the ball rolling. Cool. <laughs> when we do stuff here, we're going to talk about why things are a little bit trickier when we are in a home-like setting because we are typically trying to figure out ways to use only our body weight. True. Body weight complicates stuff, and I'll explain why. Because body weight is something that you don't necessarily understand the intensity of. How much of your body weight are you putting on your arms? Or are you holding on your legs at any one time? What happens when your center of gravity shifts just a couple inches forward or backward or side to side? And how does that relate to the relative intensity of this exercise that you're doing? It becomes a huge variable that we'll have to work around and, and we'll, we'll talk about what we can do uh, in the future. However, for right now, let's keep things simple. Weights work really well. This is why fitness gyms exist, because when you have a quantifiable number or load in front of you, it makes doing all of these calculations easy. When we are trying to it figure out- It creates a reference. It creates a reference, right. Yeah. And, and it's easy to understand if you want to increase the challenge level or the intensity of something, you can either change the reps if it's pertinent to your goals, or you can add weight and change the intensity of it. If you want to change the intensity just a little bit, you might throw a five pound weight onto the bar or grab a five pound heavier dumbbell. 
if you want a significantly greater challenge, then you would add, you know, tens of, of pounds onto the bar or grab in a twice as large dumbbell. The numbers are right there. You can start to understand what and how that relates to the relative challenge level of that exercise. It's not necessarily so with body weight. However, again, keeping things easy. I'm gonna cover my face for a second because we've got a cool little reference thing that I wanna bring in. This is a fun fun thing. Uh, this is from a, uh, a trainer named Mark Ripito. He wrote a book called Starting Strength. If you've ever been, <laughs> if you're ever interested, <laughs> If you're ever interested in learning more about strength training, that's a good way to just begin. This is a very generic scale, and it's helping you understand what rep ranges get you certain adaptations. It's not true for everybody. Everybody is different, but on a general scale, this is typically what creates the adaptations. Are you just reading it? Cool. Yeah. Uh, and the fun thing that I love about, about this graph is is uh, the the whole uh, silliness, madness, death side. I of don't the recommend spectrum. that side. <laughs> Let's stay clear of that. So, uh, when we think, Joel says, "Excellent book." It is. A, yeah, it's a very nice book. Uh, I, I read it way way back in my my freshman year of college. And it was a good way to, to get started and just understand how you can increase your strength and, and very, you know, it's a very simple, pragmatic way to begin your strength journey. Mm. With that in mind, all of these numbers you're gonna see down at the bottom, it says 100%, 70%, 25%, and then it has a number in two letters, and it says 1RM. I feel like it's weird that we're covering your face and you're talking, so we're gonna go ahead and my face. So we're gonna cover both of our faces. <laughs> and then, and then, <laughs> do you... I can't do it. Right. Ha! Hey, look, I'm looking at the graph. <laughs> we... <laughs> you, okay. Here. This is, yeah. Don't need that part. This is obnoxious. This is obnoxious. Okay, I, I, I changed my mind. Sorry. <laughs> you get my face while he talks. There you go. I'm going to slump down <laughs> real low. Oh, whoa, we just blew up with things. As long as, long as I can still activate the microphone from how far away I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Paul's asking, is this reps per set? Just making sure I understand the chart and then, then sets being subjective. Okay, so, well, real quick, before we get into that, before yeah. we get into that. Hold on, Paul, and then ask again if it's not clarified. One RM, that is standing for a metric that is called one rep max. Yes. If you are looking, let's say, to do any particular exercise, and you're trying to figure out what, which of these rep ranges get you or yield you the type of adaptation that you're looking for. That is where you, were, you would say, what, under what load or intensity can I do one of these? And it would be physically impossible, and I mean that. Physically impossible. Not that you don't want to. But that it is absolutely guaranteed failure should you try a second rep. That you cannot do it. Yeah. You cannot do it. It is not possible. Which is why it's not great to test your own one rep maxes for certain exercises on your own because, in other words, you're getting stuck. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you, yeah. And then you're stuck with the bar on your stuck. back. <laughs> So, <laughs> and then we're in quarantine, and, and then, then it's the end of the world. <laughs> so, okay. one or max. If let's say, um, uh, if if you are pistachio nerf is in the house. Oh dang! <laughs> so, if if you were going through and and let's say you put a hundred pounds on a barbell, and you were able to squat it once. And you physically cannot squat it a second time. You, uh, you're like, oh, I can't get back up, and you have to drop it down on the rack. And you're like, Jonathan's oh, shucks. upset that he says we should switch places. It's gonna not be forever. It's not gonna be forever. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> there, uh, one of uh, my my good buddy Jesse, who who actually married us, uh, he had a YouTube channel for a while uh, <laughs> called Oh man, oh, what was it? The uh, it was like this the whole time. 
It was something. It was something was with ASM the mouth. He was ASMR before ASMR. No, he well, he cut off. He cut off his eyes, <laughs> and he would do like, like really amazing poetry. Poetry. Reading. Uh, like, oh man, it was so cool. Re recit recit recitation, because he wrote it. Uh, yeah. Not reading. I don't but, know. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you could only see his mouth, and it was it was kind of cool. But regardless, back on topic. Kay. So, if if you can only squat a hundred pounds once. If you are choosing rep ranges because you want to improve your strength, I would technically, I mean, I don't necessarily, uh, I'm gonna say I don't agree 100% with this chart. I would say strength and power need to be switched, but whatever, that is what it is. You're going to find that you're going to get the adaptations that you're looking for. Is this okay? Yeah, cool, because we don't need death. We're not gonna do anything that makes us die, right? That's not good. <laughs> so, uh, we would be looking at squatting and creating a workout where we might do a couple sets of one to three reps of that weight. And we might drop it a little bit. We might say, hey, I, instead of doing one, one rep constantly, because that might not elicit exact amounts of adaptation that you want, it's not a huge stimulus that causes your body to change, you might say, I'm gonna do three reps. And if you do three reps, we already established you can't lift or squat 100 pounds three times. You can only squat it once. You have to drop the weight a little bit. And you drop it down 90%, maybe 80% of your one rep max starts to become where you are able to stay within and you're able to lift that a couple times. What you don't want to have achieve is a constant amount of, of failure repetitions, which is to say if, if you are constantly pushing yourself on each exercise until the point where you are exhausted, you can't physically do it again. Sit up straight so they see your mouth. Ta-da! If you're exhausted. Oh, <laughs> somebody subscribed and I what's, ruined it. What's up, pistachio? Oh, yay! Thank you! <laughs> I don't know why that got cut off. That's Probably because I have it. No, I must have changed something with the alert box. That would probably I don't know. Fix it Whatever. Okay. Um, so, one, one you know. rep max, three, three reps. I feel like this is completely my fault well, and Jonathan's fault. I'll blame him a little bit. <laughs> that we got. Jonathan's fault. That we're like, this is very disjointed. Start over a little bit. Summarize. Keep going. It's all good. Okay. If you're looking for strength, <laughs> and we'll talk about the differences between those in just a moment. Uh, you might cut down the weight just a little bit more. If you were lifting 90 pounds or 85 pounds, you might drop it even down to 75 pounds so you can lift it somewhere between five and eight reps. We'll explain why that is a thing in a moment. So, so far we're just recapping that 100% of your ability is one rep max, and then in order to theoretically do any other reps, you'd have to drop weight. The more reps, the more weight you'd have to drop. Correct. Okay. As you start getting into higher and higher rep ranges, that's where you're just talking about your body's ability to continue to produce the energy required to lift that weight again and it is handling all of, of the metabolic waste that comes from that. That's where you start getting into endurance-based exercises. If you're looking to succeed at performing a thousand repetitions of push-ups, that's what you're talking about. You're trying to figure out. You're trying to improve your endurance. Yes, and, and how your body can sustain that activity for a long period of time. And, is, the, and that this, would be the, your choice of adaptation. That would be your choice of adaptation. There's, there's no better choice. It's your choice. You get to choose what kind of adaptation you want. There are some that are exclusive, as in you can't necessarily train power and endurance at the same time. You're, you're, you're training two different systems there. You can do them independently, where you can have workouts that are training your power and you can have workouts that, that help stress and cause your, your cardiovascular system to adapt, but typically not in the same workout are they improving or creating a stimulus that would improve both or cause both adaptations. They are exclusive to each other. Uh, there are a lot of weird terms on here. Myofibrillar hypertrophy is talking about the actual physical size of your muscle fibers. That's just a scientific way of saying that. Sarcoplasma hy hypertrophy is silly. I know it's not listed as silliness, but this is why bodybuilders appear significantly larger 
than than most normal people doing that many repetitions of something increases gets you swole it gets you swole it, it increases a, a physical thing within your musculature but that physical thing in your musculature doesn't actually provide any extra strength it just it's an adaptation for appearance yeah yeah which, which it, again is something that you might want and you choose to and do and you choose to do yes there's a reason why you might choose to do that um Neural adaptation is a true thing. I'll talk about that eventually. And then once we start getting into lactate generation, that's the, the metabolic waste that I was talking about before. As you start getting into those, those intensity levels that are significantly lower than that one rep max. If we said 100 pounds of a squat and you're like, I want to improve my body's ability to handle and produce energy under like this specific exercise, instead of doing reps at 80 pounds or 70 pounds, you might drop that all the way down to 25% or like 25 pounds or maybe even 15 pounds and you would just do them so many times, so many times. Boom, so there's, again, it's a reason why, there are reasons why you might do all these things. Why can't you do everything? What is stopping you from lifting that 100 pound barbell a second time. Yeah, okay, that, that can go away for right now. I think we'll go with the graph. We'll cool. bring it back as we talk about individual things. What is stopping you from doing that? Do you know? I didn't ask. say the question again. What is stopping us, our, you know, I don't know, hypothetical us, okay. from squatting 100 pounds a second time? Oh, you've depleted your resources. Oh. What's the resource? I didn't know I was gonna be quizzed during this, y'all. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, your energy storages. When, and what is the energy that we need for, for muscular contractions? ATP. Wow! Bonus points. What does it stand for? Adenosine triphosphate system. Holy crap! <laughs> Sorry. That oh, was so amazing. Word. Don't say that word. Holy crap? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> She got it right. ATP. ATP, A yo. ATP. Adenosine. <laughs> adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so here's the real bonus point. Oh, Jen Can switched. you type it? Sorry. Adenosine, maybe. <laughs> Aden I'm bad at spelling anyway. My husband knows this. Yeah. Aden I'll do it on YouTube because most of our... I'll do it on both. Yeah. Because you can just copy it over. Adenosine triphosphate. That's my guess. That's Joel, act, don't make fun of me. It's actually... Did I do it good? Yeah. Very nice. Yay! Cool. I went to school, you know. <laughs> Muscular contractions cannot happen without adenosine triphosphate. However, cool, cool information. Well, why can't our body just store a ton of adenosine triphosphate in order to do all this stuff? Like, you need this molecule in order for contractions to happen. Without it, contractions don't happen. Once it's used up, you need to produce Another more of it. One. But it so that it, it goes takes, back together. Correct. And it takes time for that to work. Your body only stores a very small amount of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. It only stores a very small amount. Enough so that if Nicole were to scare me, ah! my body can instantly react. <laughs> that was rehearsed. No, it was not rehearsed. It was not. <laughs> uh, but it was prompted. However, your body needs to be able to react in those instances. Yeah. It stores ATP ready and available for, for these contractions, for when, or you know, you got, oh, or like <laughs> lift something super fast. You can't do that forever though. Phosphates are extremely heavy. When I say that, like, obviously it's microscopic, but it's still extremely heavy. If we were to try and store enough ATP in our bodies to sustain, let's say 20 to 30 seconds of activity, we would be significantly heavier creatures. It wouldn't, it wouldn't sustain it, life as we know it. It's not, it's not an adaptation that we have chosen evolutionarily it's because of the things that we do. We store the amount of ATP that makes sense to store. Correct. Also, our body has developed systems and adapted in ways that have created systems that allow us to produce more ATP 
without having to actually store the end result, ATP. You can think of this very similar to a, a compression system in, in your, you know, your computer, your files. You can compress a file down so far, even though it's this big, if you were to only store files in their full format, then it would use up all of your storage on your computer significantly faster. However, if you compress it down, it can, you know, take up a much smaller space. And then when you need it, you can uncompress, uncompress it. it. Unzip it. Unzip it, yeah. yeah. You can unzip it and you can extrapolate it back into however large it was before. When you need it, that's what our body essentially does. And it creates that in a couple of different ways. Once, once you're using up all of your stored ATP, that's typically like one to three seconds of activity, it's gone, over. You, you, you can't get it back for several minutes. Your body takes time to produce this. So, your body stores something that some of you that might follow the strength and fitness world probably have heard a lot about. It stores creatine phosphate. It's got a, a nice little system called the creatine phosphogen system. It is a phosphate molecule, just like adenosine triphosphate and it helps you after you use an ATP molecule, it can just, with one chemical reaction, one reaction, it can take the phosphate from creatine, add it into the ATP that you used to use that now becomes ADP, adenosine. Diphosphate. Diphosphate. Jens, Jens was on top of that. Oh man, check that out. He knew. He knew. And then suddenly, ta-da! You have ATP again. Yeah. And you get to use it right away. Uh, people in the strength and fitness world, one of one of the the like most amazing supplements to ever be developed is creatine supplements. However, one of the least properly utilized, utilized supplements <laughs> I know is creatine. <laughs> uh, so. The, what's a good metaphor? Well, say the reality first, and then we, and then I'll think of a metaphor. Your body has, when you take creatine <laughs> supplements, your body, you are trying to over, over storage your body with creatine. Your, your body is storing extra creatine. How can it do that? It has to do that by also retaining fluids, which is water. And it, it makes you appear larger because you've literally swelled all your bodily tissues with water and, and extra creatine. And so people typically just keep using and taking creatine they want because it makes result. them it makes them look bigger, right. right? But in actuality, what you're doing when you supplement creatine is you're making it. Creatine phosphate works for around an extra, let's say, eight to twelve seconds of activity before it's used up. And this is an intense activity before it's used up. If you were to supplement creatine, you might make that extend out to 15 seconds. And now why would you want the extended time? Because if you, let's say you were lifting something and you capped out at eight reps, you're like, ugh, I eight reps. I can't go farther you with could, this weight. I'd have to drop weight to do more reps. You might be able to add a little bit of extra weight onto a bar or whatever exercise you're doing. You can change the intensity level or you might add a couple of extra reps to it. And because you are changing the stress and the load that your body is uh, succumbing to. So, uh, so to say, yeah, to say that in a different way. So if you lift 10 pounds 10 times, that's a hundred pounds of load. Correct. So if you can do the same thing by lifting a hundred pounds once, that's the same load, but it's far more intense. So the intensity is higher, even though the load is the same. So in this situation, you're using the creatine in order to either add weight and get fewer reps to increase your load in a higher intensity situation, which has its own adaptation benefits, or you're increasing your load with more reps Mm -hmm. which has its own adaptation benefit based on the graph that we saw. Correct. And if you use it just to help you get past that plateau and then you stop using it, ta-da! You you've can't adapted. do it on your own. You've adapted. And, and Wait, then you say can, it again. If you use the creatine in that one instance oh, yes. to overcome a plateau... And then you keep going. And then you stop taking the creatine and you keep doing that thing. Yes. 
Congratulations, you've adapted. You're amazing, you learned. It's like when you try and teach me computer things and you do it for me and then I walk away. I didn't learn it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my really poopy metaphor. Sure. <laughs> okay. But you've adapted. And then you wait until your body hits a plateau again. You cycle in the creatine, you start doing it again. Your body adapts. You've, you've now been able to either lift more or uh, do more, more volume and ta-da, you can get you know, adapted again and, and respond to that stimulus. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. always take the creatine, then you're not doing anything. Right, then you're, you're, you're getting, lying to yourself. You're getting the boost, essentially, but you're not actually making the improvement for yourself to be able to not have to always use it. So it's not, a, it's not the best use of the tool. The creatine is a tool, and it would be like, this is a better metaphor, which is not mine, this is his, is that it would be like trying to hammer a nail with the other side. It's sure. not as useful. Yeah. Not, it's not an efficient way of working. Correct. Yeah. I don't know if this is a joke. I'm confused. Yen says citric acid cycle? Uh, it's not citric acid, but we, we will get there. Okay. Um, so. Stay tuned. So, that is a very clean system. It, it, you just have a creatine phosphate molecule. It gets broken apart and then added into a, ADP and ta-da, you can have, you've got readily usable energy. Your body can also extrapolate the same ATP molecule from other stuff. In this case, it would be sugars. Your body can store sugars in its muscular tissues and the, the liver, and then it can use that and have it run through a couple more chemical processes in order to end up with a final result of ATP. However, as you add more and more processes to this in the, in the attempt to uncompress this compressed molecule, just like a file system, it takes a real amount of time. If you are trying to do something powerfully, quickly, you are not doing that much in what is called glycolysis taking a, a sugar or a carbohydrate molecule and extrapolating it into ATP. If you're starting to get yourself into higher rep ranges, you are very much using up sugars in your body to create ATP molecules. You can do this anaerobically without the presence of oxygen. You can do it aerobically with the presence of oxygen. As you start getting yourself into these higher demanding cycles of creating more and more molecular processes to create that ATP, your body ends up creating metabolic waste. That metabolic waste, you might have heard lactic acid, you might have heard of hydrogen ions being added into your bloodstream that creates an acidic environment for your musculature. That metabolic waste needs to be handled, otherwise your muscles start to burn. <laughs> they burn, and eventually when it becomes too acidic, neurological processes can't happen, and your muscle fails. As in, it can no longer perform a muscular contraction. Full stop, you've hit failure, your body needs to wait for it to cycle all of that metabolic waste out of that uh, Tissue, tissue, whatever it happens to be moving. You can also, in a, in a complete opposite end of the scale, you can extrapolate ATP from a fat molecule. This takes significantly more, more time, but the end result yields you a ton more ATP molecules, and it is a super, super efficient form of energy production. It's incredibly efficient. It's not fast by any means. It's very efficient. Right now, if you're sitting here watching us, your body is burning fat to, to sustain you, to just like handle all the regular natural processes of your body. So keep that in mind. You're doing all of this at the same time. Just because, if we put the graph back up, just because you might be doing over. Just because you might be lifting something one time doesn't mean you might be taking ATP that is somewhere near those tissues already in your bloodstream because you've already taken it from a fat molecule. If it's there, it will be used. 
However, once it is used, it's not like you're gonna be pulling extra ATP anytime soon from fat molecules. It's just not gonna happen. As the load and the intensity gets lower and lower and lower, now you're able to derive more and more energy from fat, from carbohydrates, and less from your stored ATP or creatine system. You're gonna save that for when you need it. It's not hitting the correct thresholds for your body to actually use it up because you might need that later. You might be lifting your weight and then all of a sudden a bear comes into the house. Oh my goodness, a bear, ugh. <laughs> so with that said, if you're looking, if you're looking at generating more and more power, you want to be able to lift heavier and heavier things, and you're thinking about keeping yourself within that two to three, four rep range, that's where you're using up all of your stored ATP and a little bit of your creatine system, and you're you're staying in that system. What? It should also be said that rep ranges that he's talking about, that I think that there's an assumption we're making, and I want to say it out loud, that just simply doing the rep doesn't mean that that's the adaptation. So his weight for that rep range to create a power adaptation is different than me. Correct. So we would need to be working the same amount the, the in that rep range. And this is why we use percents of right. a run, one rep max, because the challenge level is relative on the individual. What, what is challenging for one person might not be challenging to a different person. And this is why if you are here for a, a, a strength class, we might have different students in the same class perform different variations of an exercise because we know that this particular intensity or this particular load isn't doing anything for one student or it might be doing a lot for a different student and we might need to substitute stuff out and or just change it. And it's not always, and to say that means it's not the choice on our end that, oh, this is more difficult, therefore this human should do that. It's actually that we are considering what adaptations they're interested in and their ability level and then creating a, a choice based on that. Yeah. Right. So like different mod, Kelsey, if she's out there calling you out, <laughs> So like we might give, uh, what, what was the conversation we had where it was, I always say, hey, this is a modification we could consider. And then Charlie's like, no, actually. <laughs> and, you, and then you decide it's a different modification because of the purpose that you want for that modification. Sure. That neither of them is incorrect. That there's yes. a choice being made. Yeah. 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 Um, also, there's something happening. Do thinkers play with nerve chemistry too? Any mind builders out there? Mind builders I, eat brains. I don't know what's going steal on. Steal the previous owner's power. What 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 is this? What is this chat that's going on? <laughs> I don't right know. Now? <laughs> but I, they've gone rogue. They've gone rogue. But I didn't want to not say it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Keep going. Okay. So, if you know that that you're trying to adapt your power system, and we say in a workout we're doing this thing ten times. That 10 times might not necessarily be uh, not coherent, but it, it might might be it might not be cohesive with your goals. And you might decide, hey, I'm gonna do this exercise, but I'm going to increase the intensity so that I'm doing this exercise therefore, three times. Yeah, therefore dropping the reps. Yeah. Or if you're, if you're looking to add more volume, you're looking to add more reps through a lighter intensity, you might up that rep range to 15. And there are reasons why you might do that. And it doesn't hurt our feelings. Mm -mm. It, it, we've, we've created this generic idea of a workout for a, a like generic person that may or may not exist. And then we kind of substitute around it and help you figure out what it is that you want specifically from it. Yeah. Um, so with, yeah. Looping it all back. Looping it all back. Yeah, for at home practice. This becomes exceedingly more challenging when you, you take weight out of the equation, or at least when you take excess weight or weight plates that have quantifiable numbers to them, when you take those away, this entire understanding becomes significantly more challenging. 
What does it mean to change the intensity or the challenge level for a push-up? How can you make a push-up more challenging or less challenging? How can you add weight to a squat right. when you don't have weight or to add Nicole to a squat? To pick up, like in our video. Or, a, or an extra human to lift, <laughs> sure. Uh, or, or a pull-up. How does a pull-up become harder if you don't have access to weights? This is, this is where the challenge becomes interesting. You can, you can still do stuff, you can still do body weight skills for reps. You could also change the system away from concentric, eccentric reps and change them to isometric holds. Does the same thing and it still uses up a, a specified uh, energy system that you might be targeting for the adaptation that you're looking for. Again, power, we're looking at the phosphagen system. Yeah. When we get into strength, what? Jens is suggesting to give a piggyback ride. Piggyback rides, sure. Give somebody a piggyback ride. If it's pertinent to your goals. Yeah. <laughs> if you're looking for strength, that's where you're looking for somewhere in the realm of eight, or uh, yeah, uh, eight, eight-ish reps or so, maybe up to 10. You start getting into endurance in the aerobic system. You start looking at stuff that's 15 reps or greater. Uh, how does that extrapolate to isometric holds? An isometric hold, something that you are able to hold for one to three seconds is somewhere still within that phosphorus system. As you start being able to hold something for five to 10 seconds, you're staying within that creatine system. As you start extrapolating that into 10 to 18-ish seconds, that's where you start going into glycolysis using sugars and whatnot. And as you start getting holds that are 25 seconds or 30 seconds or greater, that's where you're challenging your aerobic ability to sustain that isometric hold for a long period of time while generating the, the energy needed to hold it and also pulling all that metabolic waste out and eventually recycling it and whatnot. Um, I believe, Jens, what you were talking about was the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. Where you take yeah. metabolic waste and you're able to put it back in the system and recycle it and use parts of those metabolic waste and use it to create more ATP eventually. That is something that exists. Uh, but citric acid is, is stuff that you find in... Omnoms. Omnoms. <laughs> or just... Um, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so can we talk about bringing the graph back up? I feel like this is helpful for at home. Oh. Here we go. <laughs> we'll get really tall. Be really tall. Have great posture. Okay. Um, you know, talking about these rep ranges and understanding that they can't see my mouse. That's not useful. <laughs> talking about the one rep max situation and getting into like that power focus getting into strength focus getting into hypertrophy and then getting into what are you doing with your life um percentages so if if somebody in the gym like in their in their they're at at a familiarity level with what they're used to training. Oh, well, I do a push-up on the two-foot box, and when I do push-ups at the gym, I do five, and like that's my go-to number. What does that mean for them and how they can make those adaptations happen? Now, obviously, maybe the push-up is not a great example because they can go to their coffee table and simulate that, mm -hmm. but in a, in a case where maybe a lot of weight is being used and they don't have access to 100 plus pounds that they can put on their back in their home, thinking about percentages and how to adjust that and make the goal whether or not it's whether or not it's like power strength sure so when you're talking about body weight exercise you are attempting to figure out how to decrease uh, something called the mechanical advantage of those muscles that are doing the work if you're doing a push-up, or if you're trying to challenge your pressing, um, and you're trying to challenge your pressing strength, 
You're trying to figure out a way to maintain your body within that specific rep range. But let's say you could do 10 push-ups. Like 10 push-ups are not challenging, but I'm trying to improve my power. And I'm trying to be able to produce a larger but shorter intensity of a muscular contraction. How can I do that without adding extra weight? That's where you figure out how to reduce the mechanical advantage of the joints that you're working. You're pushing, you're thinking about extending out through your elbow, you're pressing out through that shoulder and holding weight at the same time with your center of gravity. If, I might be able to do this without changing. Oh, oh. there we go, okay. There was an earthquake. If you can't hear him, tell us, but I think we'll know. Or you can go farther away and do, yeah. Hold on one moment. Oh, it's doing a good job focusing on you. You ruined everything. Oh, did I ruin everything? <laughs> no, I'm here. Cool. Okay. Okay, we're gonna um, give some show and tell examples, and I'm gonna disappear for a bit and make sure he well, can be let's, seen. Let's go this way. Okay. So. so. If, if I can find a position, I get myself set, and I'm able to do a couple push-ups, I'm like, okay, cool, fantastic, this is not very challenging. I need to figure out how to remove and take away the mechanical advantage of these joints. If I start going this way, I put my center of gravity away and I start challenging different things. This is no good for me. I've taken out my shoulder from this equation. I'm starting to add more and more on my core. This is no good. I also can't really easily perform a push-up. However, if I go this way and I start creating this forward lean position, I've removed the mechanical advantage of my shoulder. I can no longer rest in any position. I am actively working to hold myself up here. Whereas here, I could probably hold this for quite a while. This is no good. If I want to move forward a little bit and now I start going, oh, this is a lot harder. My hands are so far back from my shoulder that as I drop down, I have to work significantly harder in order to press through this shape in order to get myself there. And now I can do less reps. I've changed the intensity of that exercise. And that is what we look to do with bodyweight exercise. It, it gets challenging to figure that out. If you don't understand the musculature behind that exercise, then it's difficult for you to do that with bodyweight exercise. However, once you start to understand it, it becomes infinitely easier. And cool thing about bodyweight exercises is because they use so many extra systems that we typically can't really do when we do generic weight lifting, it becomes significantly easier to extrapolate the strength that you gain from those bodyweight exercises into the movements that we do in the, uh, the the parkour world and the movement world. Back in. Again, you're getting you're getting all the behind the scenes action. Sorry, I was a weird creeper in the bottom. <laughs> I was trying to. I wanted to tell you to push through your shoulders, but then I I muted myself and oh. then yeah. <laughs> I, we were we were trying to figure out how to do a two camera setup today and it was not functioning and I'm I'm we're sad about it I'm but sad. I was really frustrated earlier. that's uh, why we, we pushed the stream back every every yeah we won't complain anyway yeah. regardless the um, uh, possibility of two camera angles in the future will definitely get resolved and that'll be fun yeah I'm excited all right Nicole is <laughs> What? I was smeagling. You were smeagling? I was. I was trying not to. <laughs> My precious. Okay. <laughs> Y'all make me oh, happy. Oh, man. We um, miss you. We do miss you so much. So if you have, you know, if you've had struggles so far and you're watching and you can think of something that you would like an example of, modification for or some brainstorming around in order to help achieve what you want to achieve or things that maybe you've abandoned now is the time to ask because we can do a little smeagle show and tell <laughs> okay so so let's say this let's say we have a squat and a squat 
is not hard mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. And we can do too many of them. Yes. How can we change the challenge level of the squat? We can add tempo. How else can we change without getting complicated with tempo? I mean, hold it longer, but that would be a different adaptation. I'm, I don't know the answer. Hmm. We're trying to take the same muscular and joint actions. Right. We can't change our weight quickly. We can totally change our weight, <laughs> but not quickly. <laughs> so, uh, although although sometimes it feels like it uh, in one direction more so than the other, Jens, but that's okay. Jens' suggestion is a pistol squat, which would be taking away the mechanical advantage of two limbs. What, what did he do then? He took away a limb. And now you're trying to move the same amount of weight on with, less of your body. With only one leg. Good job, Jens. Wow. You're smart. You took a two limbed action and you turned it into a one limbed action. The difficulty for that is that it's like there's a threshold of either you can or you can't. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And and there 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 might be a moment where you're thinking, oh, Push-ups are so easy, so I'm just gonna do one-armed push-ups. And those like are significantly harder than just regular two-armed push-ups and require significantly more core activity, a lot more balance in order to make it work the correct way, right. otherwise you're just overloading your shoulder. And there are very real reasons why you might be able to do a ton of two armed push-ups and then you try to go for one, and it's not possible. <laughs> but there are again, other other tools that you can use instead of changing the challenge level, for, level from this to this, you might be able to change things up from going from this challenge level to that challenge level, and that's what you might be looking for. If you change to, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, going back to the squats, uh, Paul says you were a mind reader and that, where is it on chat? Oh, if he wants to do fat jumps, what's the best way to do it? And you created the answers. Now we're gonna find fat some jumps. modifications <laughs> to squats. <laughs> Um, the springy push-ups where you clap your hands behind your back require confidence, says Jens. That's true. So going back to one-arm push-ups, an option instead of two-arm, but making it attainable, you were saying. Uh, you could change change the mechanical advantage of your arm by dropping to your knees. And now you've taken a little bit of body weight off of you. You've also put a little bit more body weight towards the support, which is your knees. And now you might be able to accomplish that same action with a little bit more ease and not be so unattainable. You could also angle. You could change the angle. Change the level. There's no reason why you can only do push-ups on the floor. You might, if you have a staircase in your house, you can easily change the intensity of how much weight your arms are moving by inclining and putting yourself at a taller and taller incline. If you are just beginning your strength journey and you physically are unable to do any push-ups, I promise you, you can lean against a wall and do wall push-ups. I know that it sounds stupid, but everybody starts somewhere and the whole point of this is that everybody is working at the same challenge level. You might be doing different versions of the exercise, but the challenge level will always be the same. And I think that's the hardest thing to get through to people that are trying to understand more and more about what working out means. Working out is a stressor. You are trying to create the stress required to get the adaptations that you specifically want. It will never get easier because if your workout is getting easier, you've changed the challenge level and you are no longer training at an, at an intensity that is causing your body to adapt. You're just moving. You're, you're um, what's the word? Maintaining. You're maintaining. Which is also a choice. Sure, yeah. So at some absolutely. point, people will choose to just maintain and not interested in their adaptation. Yeah. And then their workouts get easier. Yes. Yeah. Um, pistol squats are cool. You could also do lunges. Lunges Duh. change, yeah. Uh, you, can, you can use 
your second limb, but make it a little bit less helpful by putting it so far behind you. And now you're putting a little bit more weight on one limb and it has to now lift and, and produce more force in order to get you up and down. But without having to real, it's not as intense. So being able to use a slider for lunges. Cool. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, without getting into too many specifics, how do you construct and set up your own workout that you're looking to do? For almost anybody, or let's say this, if, you're, if you've gotten this far into our live stream. Good job. <laughs> Good job. I feel like we probably lost a lot of people at the ATV. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. You're the true, you're the true <laughs> listeners, <laughs> watchers. You're the true fans. Um, no, but uh, you actually care about learning how to take care of yourself and, and be yourself. able to choose the, the specific adaptations that you're looking for. Um, there are very real reasons why you might hyper-specialize. If you've ever seen people or like seen all the, the jokes and the memes of like, don't skip leg day. For you, if you've made it this far in the live stream, every workout is leg day. Every workout is arm day. You are not going to progress at a steady enough rate by having like a leg workout once a week or a back workout once a week, and then a bicep workout once a week. You're not doing enough stressing your body in order to have it change. Little did you know, bodies hate change. They hate it because it's really hard and it's taxing. And if you've, I don't know, like your body is so good at just lying to you and being like, I don't need to do this right. I can do this later. <laughs> I could totally do this easier. <laughs> I don't need to do it like or, this person is telling me to. Probably more realistically, like that was that was enough. Sure, that yeah. was enough. Uh, yeah, this is fine. This is good. I'm I'm great. Uh, yeah, it, it's really good at, at lying to itself. Um, and and that's basically just to say I sort of lost my train of thought, but I'm gonna kind of work through it on and as I go through. Uh, that's that's to say that no, it's totally gone. So you were talking and when you do that thing where you ramble and then you make me forget what you were saying. Chat can help us out. But you were talking about if you are doing oh no. Oh no. <laughs> if you are if you are interested in an adaptation but you are doing the silly thing which is leg day, bicep uh, yes. day, and then once a week is not enough because Because your body needs to constantly be stressed in order to be forced. It won't do it willfully. You have to force your body to elicit that change, that adaptation. If you're only working out once a week, you are very likely not doing enough to force change, or at least force any sort of noticeable or rapid enough change. If you're working out every day, you are giving your body too much stimulus and it likes to just shut down. And then you are only regressing and you are not progressing. What's this? That's what you're talking about. Death. <laughs> Working out every day, all the time, constantly. Right. Okay. Your body, your body goes through cycles. There are very real reasons for that cycle. <laughs> your body needs to be stressed, <laughs> and then that depletes it. But then it has to go through that moment of rest where it can compensate, and then you can work out again. Joel says, just at me next time. <laughs> just at you next time. Yeah. We know. <laughs> uh, right. You can't work out every single day. They're, they're typically, for most people, three times a week is very useful. And it's very, uh, it, it's, a, it's a super efficient way of seeing real progress. progress. Can you get away with two times a week? Sure. Again, it's just, it, you're, you're kind of lessening your overall effect. You start getting into four times a week and now that's getting a little bit too much. It's, it's just based on whether or not your body can handle workout, rest day, workout, rest day, workout, rest day. And keep in mind that he's also talking about working out for one adaptation. So like we said in the very beginning, if you are interested in training endurance and power, 
they're not able to be done at the same time. So if you're so not, not to say working out four days a week, moving your body four days Correct. a week, that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actively having a regimen that you're creating for an adaptation four times a week or more is questionable whether or not there's benefit. Correct. Or that it would actually degrade. Yeah, and it's perfectly fine to do a strength workout and then the following day do some some cardio that that you know helps train your endurance a little bit. Yeah, and says, and with age, you cannot just keep getting stronger. <laughs> yeah, forever. <laughs> yeah. He said Latin. Yeah. <laughs> the end. <laughs> cool. Um, right. Ad infinitum. I don't want to say it wrong. I said it wrong. Yeah, it it does not continue yeah. into perpetuity. It, uh, yeah. It, uh, it, again, there's, there's diminishing returns on, on almost everything in life. Life is about balance. You start getting yourself out of balance and it, like, the systems can't Collapse. necessarily keep themselves up. Yeah. This is why typically athletes are done performing at the extreme levels that they perform by the time they're sometimes 30 or 40. Um, it's very rare to see like football players, like you don't see football players in their 50s. They're done. They they can no longer compete or they can no longer recover quickly enough to continue performing at that level and it's super damaging for their bodies. So they stop doing it. Should we all strive to perform like elite athletes? Eh? No. Unless you, you want to be, it. unless right. you value performing like an elite athlete, then, then yes, there are very real reasons and that's okay. You can totally want to do that. Otherwise, we're looking for balance. Paul says, so a better regimen doesn't necessarily target muscle groups. So for example, arm day, back day, etc., but rather fitness groups. Not Correct. sure if that's the right term. For example, endurance, strength, power. Yes. Yes. You are, you are crafting a workout for the group that you're looking for, as in the system that you are trying to stress and adapt to. If you are looking to build more strength, you need to challenge that system. If you are looking to challenge your, uh, your body's ability to maintain energy systems, you need to challenge that system but you're not doing just arm day or leg day. Eventually, eventually, you might be working through such high intensities and the load that you are moving is so significant that one rest day is no longer adequate for you. And, that and you, you need, need to rest yeah. two days, sometimes even three days. And this is where you start getting it. Yep. I wanna talk about that. Go. The first thing he says, and then within these groups, three times a week is ideal for each fitness group. So this is related. So yes, you could be correct, Paul, what you just asked or said, um, but what Charlie's starting to go into is that at that point, if in order for everything to cuddle and heal and be ready and benefit best, it might need two rest days. So if you were theoretically doing three times a week, you would need to have a rest day, rest day, rest day, right? And repeat, rinse and repeat. But if you need two days in between, well, now your set of adaptation cycle, is that a good way to say that? Sure. An adaptation cycle, one cycle doesn't necessarily mean seven days or one week. It could actually mean, ah, uh, it's actually a week and a half, and then it resets. So in other words, if I were interested in building my strength, then I would be choosing rep ranges and intensities that are pertinent and helpful for building strength. But maybe at that time, it's getting to the point where, okay, I'm not able to add on as much weight each set, each cycle, each and I need more rest time in between. So then my week set, my cycle could be a week and a half. And then now when I get ready to do my three times workout at my new intensity, for example, the first time you load weight on squats, let's say it's a hundred pounds and I'm doing my thing and I'm feeling strong and now I'm ready to add after my third workout session, I'm ready to add weight. And so I slap on 10 pounds and I do that for a little while. And then I get to the point where I can like, I need to slap on only five and I need a little bit extra time in between that week and a half. Was that rambly or was that okay? No, that's fine. Um, but I, I would also <laughs> say that as, as your muscular groups start requiring more and more rest periods, it's not like you're doing a full body workout with arms, core and legs 
in, in the same workout and now you need to rest three days. Instead of doing that, you can make this significantly easier on you while keeping the consistency up by starting to specialize and only doing your leg workout day. And again, this is because you are no longer a beginner athlete or a beginner lifter or a beginner in your journey, whatever the journey happens to be. You are starting to get to intermediate advanced stages. Again, if you're watching this this long, you're, probably... you're a beginner, <laughs> and that's that's fine. Uh, <laughs> but the reason why the reason why some people do split up their muscular groups is because, or at least if they're doing it properly, it's because they're lifting in such great intensities or under such great loads, they require all of that extra time to recuperate from it. And so they're gonna break things up. And they're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna do a lot of volume and intensity on my legs on Monday. I won't be able to do a workout for my legs again until Friday. So instead of just waiting that entire time and skipping uh, Wednesday, I'll make my arm day Wednesday. And then they might have another, again, they're doing that much intensity and load on their arms so that they keep switching it up. Arm day, leg day, arm day, leg day. They need that extra recovery time. 95% of you don't need the extra recovery time. Your body <laughs> is ready to go 24, 24 so to good. 48 <laughs> hours later. 24 to 48 hours later, your body's ready to go. Your brain might tell you otherwise. It might say, nah, man, we, we totally need more time. Don't listen to it. it. It's probably lying. It's probably lying and it's probably just like, I don't want to, because brains are whiners and, and yeah, they, 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 don't, they don't like it, but it's okay. And, and we, we start trying to find that consistency. You get the consistency, you create the habit, the habit sticks, the habit forms, and you keep moving and progressing. Good Great. questions. Any, any chat? No, no we're good. No okay. other chat. Oh, there's some, some more snark from Joel, I think. Of but. course. Oh, <laughs> of course. Uh, no illusions there. I'm far from intense enough to need that kind of recovery, says Paul. Yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> with okay. that said, with that said, when we are crafting our generic style workouts, we are always typically doing some sort of pressing exercise, some sort of pulling exercise, some sort of core exercise, and some sort of leg exercise. Keeping Obviously in mind, legs have two well, right, and so there are there are some extra specifications that you might be able to do where where the sense of like we're doing with arms we're doing pulling and pressing. Your legs are really well designed for pressing, like pushing load away. That doesn't mean that you can't also do stuff that creates a pulling force with your lower body. And that would be where we start considering um, like, like posterior chain type of stuff. When we start doing straight leg deadlifts or we start doing glute ham raises or hamstring curls or glute bridges, those are kind of creating pulling forces, not necessarily pushing forces. Um, but it's still, I still consider those as legs in the beginning stages. They're, they're still all sort of encompassing. You're still using and stressing a lot of the musculature of your body. And again, it's causing adaptation. And, um, for, and for movements that you're choosing that are more combination or like in, <clears throat> for the individual is intense in multiple areas of the body. Sure. And you want to keep that in mind what you're pairing together so that you're not over intensifying one thing. So if you're doing something that's very tendon heavy, elbow and then you're like well i need to do a push so let's do more push-ups and that's really tough. yeah then that can be sure might be too spread uh, it around yeah what that might be too much might be starting to get a little too advanced sorry for, for, but that's okay um not the focus not the, the focus the only other generic explanation that i want you to leave with today before we can continue talking about workouts Adaptation has to have a couple things in order for it to occur. 
I always say that when you're trying to build something, or if you're trying to build something the correct way, you've got an architect who's who's got the blueprints in order to build something, but blueprints alone don't build buildings. You also need building materials to build a building. You can have building materials, as in calories and and you know food and the like if you are taking in more calories than your body is expelling it has an extra surplus of building materials that could asterisk could go to muscle building if you have the appropriate plans available to tell it how to build in our case in this analogy the blueprints are hormones. You need hormones in order for any of these building materials to go and do stuff in your body. Without them, they don't go anywhere. And typically, you take an excess amount of calories, your body will store it because we're still built for the cave 1800s. And when, caves. Sure, and caves. And, and like, Food wasn't around all the time. Feast and famine. And we would, yeah, we would very much go through times of famine and like, you don't want to just die. <laughs> Body's ready Good. for that famine. Right. It's ready. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's really efficient <laughs> at storing excess calories. It's not extremely great at using it because again, it doesn't want to use it because when it, when you use it, it means that you're in a famine and that's stressful and that's not fun. And so your body's like, ah, we, we don't need to do this yet. Uh, so another metaphor. Do the refrigerator metaphor. Freezer. The freezer metaphor. Ooh, I'm going to have you do that one. Okay. I'm going to do a different one. Okay. Uh, hormones uh, that build up your body are called anabolic hormones. Hormones that tear down structures in your body are called catabolic hormones. You've probably heard of anabolic hormones because that's what unfortunately bodybuilders typically I'm gonna say supplement because you can take steroids responsibly but typically people don't <laughs> typically people are looking for an easier faster way to build bodily structures just like the creatine ab right. not abuse I don't want to say abuse I mean, it does get abused. It, it gets abused, and that's why that's why anabolic hormones get the bad rep that they have. And and I mean, they kind of deserve it because it's so easy to do it incorrectly, and then it has real health uh, consequences for you. But the reason why I bring this up is because when a bodybuilder shoots steroids they, it comes in a vial or like a little syringe right it's a liquid of these you know excess anabolic steroids it's synthetic they're not like their body is not producing it naturally they're increasing and you know trying to create more of this blueprint in their system they take that syringe i know this is weird they just they shoot it right in their butt yeah right in the big meaty the bit big meaty bit the big meaty bit Bodybuilders don't get abnormally large glutes. They do have large glutes, but they're all uniform with the rest of their body. Are you trying to make the metaphor link to like, tone your arm? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. You, you, if you shoot steroids into your bicep, into your left bicep, your left bicep and will not just your become- your right bicep will be, ben be changed from them sure right everything it's all connected. increases <laughs> in size uniformly right how exactly or specifically your body creates mass is is all determined based on your genes that is that is like your parents you can blame them as much as you want so like when I, when I, like, I, my body is so good at building leg muscle and not very good at building arm muscle. Ha! Anti, Thanks, anti mom. Anti-Popeye. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but that could easily be the opposite, right? But regardless of that, when you increase size one area of your body, everything is also increasing in size. The, the, uh, I heard a good analogy. I don't have a reference for it on stream here. However, one, I remember 
hearing that if you wanted to increase your bicep or the circumference of your arm one inch, your body was adding 10 pounds of mass. It's not adding 10 pounds here, it's adding 10 pounds everywhere. And then therefore, Because you can't specifically target just one area and increase that. Hormones work on a systemic scale. Your entire body is increasing in size. If you are producing catabolic hormones, your entire body is pulling and breaking down tissue, fat tissue as well as muscular tissue. It all goes away. It's a catabolic system of tearing down. You're, you're demolishing structures rather than building them up. You need to create the type of scenario that gets you the adaptation that you want. When you start talking about staying within a high intensity system of phosphogen system and to a certain extent glycolysis, that is a building up scenario where those specific systems elicit large gains in anabolic hormone production. Your body becomes like almost triggered in the sense of saying, oh geez, this is awful. <laughs> we need to become better at this. <laughs> and your body starts producing more anabolic hormones. It puts that, resources towards that. And then you can put resources into building more and more muscular size so that you can produce more force through your, those muscular tissues. If you start doing more aerobic stuff, sustained, long, active intensity exercise, that typically is creating catabolic hormone production in your body. It is a breakdown of muscular and fat tissue. They all go away. That might be something that you're looking for. There are very real reasons why you might want that. For instance, if you are attempting to get to a specific weight, let's say um, climbers. Climbers are typically not beefy people because the more mass that you have to hold, the more they have to pull. The more they have to pull. Climbers are typically very small framed people with high muscular intensity. They don't need muscular size. They just need to be able to produce as much force for a small frame. They train strength, but they they also create situations where they are working out and creating catabolic hormone systems that break them down so they are not becoming large people so that they can increase their strength relative to their size. Which, oh, bring that back up. E What are we doing? Neural adaptation. Oh, neural adaptation. Wait, but we gotta talk about the freezer. Oh my goodness. These are, there's so much, this is this all is, complex, but it's okay, yeah. But also we could talk about it forever. We as can't you talk know, about we've this already forever. gone over and there's an hour. a lot of, of <laughs> learning that can be gained here. This is like, you know, oh my goodness, how old am I? I actually don't know. This is like 14 years yeah. of education, just like all stored <clears throat> right here. That's all trying to come out as fast as possible. Okay, wait, so going back. So hormones, right? He talked about the blueprint metaphor, the blueprint metaphor, which I really like, but the, the missing link is the quality of person reading the blueprints. So if you have somebody who is not an architect that doesn't understand how to read the blueprints, then the building materials and the blueprint are useless because then it's not building what it wants to build. So talking about how hormones play a role in that, making sure that efficiently. Yeah. Um, the freezer metaphor is great. So there's, you know, not only are we choosing all these different movements in our body and rep ranges and intensities and volumes to help create adaptations that we choose, but also that the way that we live our life and the things that outside of those sessions that Paul was talking about, like that ideal three time a week until we get to that more intermediate advanced stages where we need more rest, um, you're able to pull from those materials, those resources, those energy storages, and that you're able to do that well. So when you're doing this for the first time, you have a storage freezer in your basement and your body's like, I'm not going into the basement. 
that's really far away. And so it's going to always pull from the freezer in your fridge because that is close easier. and easier. Closer. And so at some point for certain adaptations, so let's say weight loss, um, you might need to pull excess energy storages from the freezer down in the basement because as Charlie said, we're really good at preparing for famine. We're really good at doing that with our bodies. So your body's not going to want to learn how to go down into the basement until you practice and with things that you can do in your life, like sleeping really well, regulate, to regulate your hormones, fasting helps regulate your hormones, all these different things that we can choose to do in life to help make sure that we are able to travel down into the basement freezer and not just the upstairs freezer. <laughs> That's the metaphor I like. Yeah. Uh, Joel's asking where to go. He's finding it weird that his pistol squats are easier on the bar trainer, and is it possible I'm doing it wrong? My guess is that you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Probably you're lifting your heel, question mark. If you're doing that, you're getting more range of motion, more so because now your bum is able to... Well, actually, no, that would make it a little bit... I would guess that you're probably doing it wrong because the balance aspect should make it harder. So other than the fact that it's cheating mobility. Uh, you are no longer forced to lift your other leg as high. off the floor so because the, the bar trainer has an active amount of like height to it. The... And if your heel is just hovering over the floor, it's below the object that you're standing on. Changing, changing the intensity of it a little bit. So my but, brain my brain yeah. originally went to your hips are able to go lower, which would actually make it more challenging. So if you were to be really rid, rigid, literally, cable rod, and make sure that your heel is above the false ground of the bar, that would be one way to change the intensity or challenging. I'm stronger. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so... When, when we're thinking about improving improving systems, uh, you can improve all of those systems while still thinking about working arms with pressing, pulling, as well as your core and legs and whatnot, um, and just change the, the intensity level of them for whatever you're looking to do. Uh, I have a thought, but I don't yeah. want to interrupt. No, go for I it. I already did. It's okay. I feel like there are a lot of different humans out there, and like Charlie said, if you're watching at this point, probably not the human yet that is so advanced in their training. But granted, I don't even like saying that because there are people that are advanced in their training because they've been told what to do and that they don't really know why. Sure. So that, that could be a human out there. Tell me what I want. Exactly. And that's fine. Like That's why you pay us and why we are who we are and do what we do. Um, but there's also people out there that it's like, I could imagine feeling, well, I don't even feel that I care about do, building strength or whether or not that's the adaptation I want. I just want to feel better when I go chase my kids. And I don't want to get so tired as quickly. So sure. It's like, how do you change that brain thought process of getting that assigned label adaptation without it being a negative? Be able to say, well, that's great and it's not, I, it makes my brain think of all the crap in the me excuse me, all of the poopiness in the me media. I don't want to say those words. I'm sorry. Um, wash my mouth. Censored. <laughs> um, oh, turn it that. It makes me think of everything that's in the media about how, like, oh, tone your abs or get the thigh gap or get this or get that. And it's like that's the adaptations that they're making people feel that association with moving your body and exercising, that's really frustrating. So if that is what you're bombarded with, then how do you approach this training in a positive light? Like therapy session where we don't wanna go, is this okay? Sure, no, this is fine. Uh, visual, visual adaptations slash non-quantifiable adaptations are almost always going to end in disappointment. Right, so you need to quantify the adaptation that you're interested in, why, and then decide ways to get there that benefit that choice. Right. Not worry about the rest. Yeah. So understanding that, you know, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't do like a good core workout, so now I'm the end of the world human. Like, no, it's fine. Yeah. Just move your body. <laughs> there was, um, there, uh, back in the day, I have not looked or heard of this particular coach in a very long time, 
However, back in the day when I was learning a lot about uh, strength training and strength building and just physiology in general, there was a coach for the junior, the men's junior Olympic team named Coach Sommer. He created and spun off his own little system for his methodology in training his gymnasts and kind of crafted it towards more basic tier strength building of basically like what starting strength is with Mark Ripito. Coach Sommer did for people looking to do body weight strength stuff. Um, but what his his catchphrase was really uh, kind of ahead of its his, his time for a moment, and his catchphrase was "form follows function," and I think more often than not, because of all of the the visualization that we're bombarded with every single day with the fitness industry, because unfortunately, once the marketing industry got a hold of fitness, it's just like, oh my God, it went downhill so fast. But people do this the opposite way. They, they, see, they see the form that they want, and that's all that they're looking for. And your form is a derivative of the stuff that you do. If you are able to lift a ton of weight, you are going to visually look different than somebody who can lift a lot of weight, but also is understanding how to like, I don't want to say starve themselves, but like get their body weight or uh, body fat mass so low that they look visually appealing for a very specific amount of time. A power lifter, somebody that can just produce a ton of force does not look like a bodybuilder because they're not a bodybuilder. They don't train like a bodybuilder. They train like a power lifter. They look like a power lifter. A bodybuilder looks like a bodybuilder. A climber looks like a climber and so on and so forth. A marathon runner looks like a marathon runner. The, 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 the difference between like sprinters and marathon runners is very drastic. It, it, well, that's the other thing of there's a there's a huge difference between sprinting a short burst of intensity Power. and anabolic producing activity versus the catabolic long steady state cardio endurance. and endurance that that you know a marathon runner does and they create different forms the forms will be different you see a, a you know a, a lineup of sprinters they all have different body shapes and sizes and masses you see a lot of marathon runners, a lot of different body shapes and masses. However, if you see somebody that looks like they do really well at a marathon and they line up for the 100 meter dash, <laughs> it's, I, it's probably like, I know, it's though. probably not gonna <laughs> end up so well, right? Like the, they, they don't have the form for the function that they're about to compete and perform in. Right. If you, if you are interested in visual changes and adaptations, understand nobody that you visually look at is you. And so you don't know what you're going to look at. What you should look at is what function elicits the form that I'm looking for. And then you do that function. And so that's where we start considering like, we as tracers, people that do parkour, are very pretty well-rounded people because we do kind of everything. everything. We do everything. Including pistol squats on bars. <laughs> but with that in mind, a, a somebody who only trains parkour won't necessarily be amazing at climbing. Right. It's a, it's a specific task. It's a specific skill. You gotta that, think about the right. amount of time spent on 17 20 million different techniques right. in parkour versus smaller subset yeah. of climbing. And it doesn't mean that you're lesser than, no. it just means that you didn't train for this. Right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull Isioma into this. We had a, a student not so long ago named Isioma. You, if you, you probably have ever known him if you were in class because he's so like boisterous. He was, the, he was so boisterous and brolic. He's huge. <laughs> you know what I mean? But Isioma was a, a power lifter, and he can produce so much force. In fact, oh when he my got God. really excited for a wall pass, he put his foot through the wall. That's true, yeah. The, the hole in the wall in the old gym was because of Isioma. But we love him anyway. We love him anyway. 
but we were doing, we were trying, we were practicing our roles once, and Isioma, because he is really good at efficiently lifting so much more weight than I can ever contemplate over his head, and he needs to do that safely, he has developed such a sturdy, rigid back. It was incredible. That was the adaptation that helped him do that. He liked being able to lift a lot of weight over his head. He's a power lifter. He wanted to be able to do heavy snatches. It was something, you know, taking a barbell from underneath him on the floor and putting it up over his head in one fast jerk motion, right? It was incredible. But that adaptation might mean that other things fall by the wayside. He, he, w he was trying to train roles. Isioma very much could not really curve his back. <laughs> and he would just kind of like, kunk, kunk, on the floor. Vum, vum, right. Vum, vum. <laughs> it, it was like watching a, a, a bracket try to roll. Yeah. And it's like, kunk. <laughs> it's, it's not smooth at all. And it was, it, he, he kind of got up after doing a couple of these and like not working out so well. And he, he kind of like looked at us, he goes, I really want to, to want this and get better at this, but I also <laughs> really want to lift heavy things over my head. And it's in this one specific moment, it's, it's easier for me to be like, oh, I, I can't do this. I should be able to do this, but I have the adaptation that I chose and I have to live with that. That was really insightful. And that was super insightful. Of he, he chose a specific adaptation and it wasn't able to uniformly transfer into everything. Because he was so specified in this one category, he lost a little bit in this category. But again, it depends on, on what your goals are, are toward. And if that goal is no longer being met, then you need to change something in order to, to get yourself to that goal. Joel, Joel was make, gonna make sure that everybody knew about the hole in the wall too, and he was like, "Oh, you got there first. <laughs> yep. Isioma with the hole in the wall. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you 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 get the adaptations that you choose. Yeah. If and that every everything you're being right now is an adaptation, right? That is an adaptation. <laughs> if if like you. Don't, you have a, a habit of not stressing your body, of not working out regularly, of not challenging your systems, then you are an adaptation of non-stress. And that is its own thing, and that's okay, right? Because if here is where you don't want to be, if you want to be here, you need to start doing things that get you there. If you start doing things that get you there, but you actually wanted to be there, that's not helpful. That's not helpful, That right? was a waste of time. <laughs> it's equally as much of a waste of time. Right. You need to figure out what your goals are first, and then you try to create the path that gets you there. Right. So that's, yeah. Is there any part of the graph that people wanted? I'm just going to put that out, and then we'll talk more. But sure. if there's any parts of the graph that people were more interested in that we didn't talk a lot about because you didn't um, really talk I, about neural adaptation. I didn't really talk about neural adaptation. So it is, it, it is, tacks yeah. on to what you were just talking about, how if you're if you're choosing form, I don't want to say form over function, I'm saying that at some point if you are wanting the adaptation to be very holistic, oh that's not the right way, ah uh, Nicole, if you are wanting to be able to lift heavy 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 things at some point you will need to put on more mass. However, more mass has repercussion, meaning could could impede mobility. So you think of like big, big bodybuilders, and I don't want to say generalizations because then you think of Juji Mufu and then his amazing mobility and a crazy power lifting and that's super cool. So to put in the work to get there. But typically that more mass is going to mean hinged. Uh, impede. And thank you. Impeded movement. And so if you have really, really big quads, so you can squat really, really, really heavy, probably can't squat as low as somebody who has lesser sized quads. So neural adaptation is what we're talking about? Sort of. Yeah. Um, 
In order for a muscular contraction to happen, you need a neurological stimulus to tell your muscle fiber to contract. I just saw chat. If oh. it it is rare it is whoa, it is rarely appreciated, but I developed the ability to play computer games for over ten hours at a time. As long as I don't think. That's that's an adaptation. <laughs> that is an adaptation. Uh, and then Joel says, so basically, if my dream adaptation is unimaginable destructive power, I should avoid marathon training. <laughs> yeah. Un unless <laughs> if he wants to be so unless powerful. every step you take creates destruction. In which case, you want Ooh. as many steps as possible. <laughs> but, but again, this, yeah. Um, okay, neural, neural adaptation, because we didn't talk about that. Uh, you can create a contraction by thinking about it, as in like, yay, cool, right? Like, I can force that to happen. I'm going to remove the graph. Yeah, sorry. Versus um, like contractions that you're in You can also, do. for instance, when, when we go... Uh, when we go to um, our chiropractor, okay. and and he needs to like oh, you, don't, oh. you can't you can't adjust somebody cold. He he puts like hot packs on us, but he also stimulates the musculature a little bit, and he uses electrodes, and he like uses a a box that creates impulses from one electrode to another electrode, and when they're put on your body, they create and you know complete that circuit and musculature that's in between by activates ends. by ends they it activates and you cannot stop that from happening if you ever have experienced a, a twitch where you're like why is my calf twitching what is going on why is that happening there is a weird neurological imbalance going on where signals are being sent to that musculature without you like in the process they're not asking you for permission it's just happening when you breathe that is not a conscious thing although you can over overcome that and transfer that into a conscious thought but like it would be terrible to live through life and have to always remember to breathe <laughs> and be like oh i forgot to oh okay all right <laughs> and it, like that's crazy it happens on its own through your body creating a rhythm of signals of neurological signals that cause contractions to happen in certain musculature to upkeep all of that that or all that system uh you can get better at that your body can become better at sending neurological signals also when your body sends a neurological signal to a part of your muscle your entire muscle is not contracting i understand that it looks like your muscle is shortening because it is you take the length of this and you do this yes all of the muscle is shortening but not all of the muscle fibers within that muscle are active they're just following along that's to say that if all of your muscle fibers were to contract at the same time it would be a considerable amount of force all at once it would be trying to write your name with a with a pencil but having all of your musculature get activated you're like <laughs> you can't make fine motor control movements in a system where all of your muscle gets activated at the same time instantly at the you know the snap of, of fingers or the, the I don't know, drop of a hat it can't happen so you have certain muscle muscle fibers that get activated and these are called motor units one nerve activates one or several muscle fibers within that muscle and your body creates this pattern and system and this is what's called muscle memory where your body can become more efficient when it uses one muscle pathway or nerve muscle pathway more times that becomes more efficient you stop having to focus on it less and then it can just kind of happen. A signature is a very real repeated system of small fine motor control movements that your body understands and can produce like over and over and over again. When we signed the, the mortgage, for instance, we had to sign what, like 50 papers? It was a lot. It was a lot. 
a lot of signatures, right? A long time right? ago. <laughs> um, but like that is that is a neurological pathway. It is creating signals and activating certain muscle fibers to do this action over and over and over again. So what I was trying to say was that at some point you're going to reach maximum capacity, efficiency, ability, and in order to have more gain or improvement, if you want to be able to lift more as the specific adaptation, you'd have to put on more mass. mass. At some point in the mass and with what's going on, you're gonna create that that full efficient system. Sure. And you're gonna max it out. And if you don't put on more muscle mass and do a go mad, well, okay. So if if you were if you were to not be eating in a way that actually increases your muscular size, you can still see Gain gains in your strength. Right. And that would be because of a neurological adaptation. Your body becomes better at signaling all of your muscle fibers to pull at the same time. The analogy that I use for this is if you're driving in a car with four, with you and three buddies, and your car breaks down, if you get out and you try to push that car, that is not an efficient way of moving that car. If you and a second buddy go out and push it together, your task is now made easier and you are able to push this load. There's more work being done. There's more work being done, right? By, by two people. However, even though you have two people working, if you push and then stop, and then your buddy pushes and then stop, you have two people working, but at different but times. It's inefficient. And it's an inefficient system. You're not pushing at the same time. I'm the Charlie Whisperer. Yes. <laughs> Your, your nervous system can become better at all signaling your muscle fibers at the exact same moment that you need them to produce force, creating more force production. That is a neurological adaptation. You've, be, you've become able to generate more force without increasing muscular size. That's cool. Yeah. That's. That's could, incredible. Could be an adaptation you value. It could be an adaptation that you value. At a certain point in time, you only have so many motor units, you only have so many muscle fibers, you can never increase or get more muscle fibers. You have the amount of muscle fibers that you have. So at a certain point in time, you will cap out. And uh, I, I think I've only ever known one person in my life who I, I could say, you are capped out at your neurological system. You cannot do anything more unless you add weight and, and whatnot. Um, and he's actually an author named Stephen Lowe, good buddy. Uh, he wrote a, a really amazing book, if you are interested in learning more about body weight strength, called Overcoming Gravity. Imagine that, Overcoming Gravity. His name is Stephen Lowe, L-O-W. It is an incredible, incredible book. He is very smart. at. I feel like the last time I saw him, he was a 5'8", 130 pound dude that can do like eight one-arm chin-ups. That's insane. That is so many one-arm chin-ups. And it, like he could just like switch arms too. And just then that was forever. enough time that he was like recuperating enough energy that he could just like, continue going that's incredible and he was 130 pounds and like again these are all adaptations that he chose and it would probably be really challenging for him to get to like 10 one-arm chin-ups in a row without adding physical mass and size so that he can produce more force um yen's left for dinner so paul and joel because i think you're the two that are the chatty chatty cathy's chatty cathy's which we appreciate uh any other last questions or thought processes and this because an hour <laughs> yeah. uh joel says oh sorry i mean is that okay i should ask you ahead of time if that i did it already i did it a lot Oops. my bad Name drop, drop the mic. You're doxing them. I, what does that mean? It means you're, you're, uh, you're, what, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You are outing them. Outing them on the internet or, yeah. I'm sorry. Yep. I hope that that's okay because I did it. 
Um, I do that to him all the time on the nerf. I I ruin. Technically, you would need first and last name. Oh, I wouldn't do that. But that's, um, that's yeah. like a privacy thing. That's why you're not doxing it. And also, who knows who these people? Are? Right. I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this yeah. So we thought this could be interesting. We knew that maybe this wouldn't be what everybody expected because it's not so useful to do one live stream and be like, here's ideas of how to create a workout for yourself because that's what we're doing when we do the strength stream specifically and give you circuit. Just wanted to try and empower the understanding. Yeah. And so maybe that you could start dabbling. If you'd like to send us examples, you know, you and no background and all that, then happy to take a look. Yeah. And and if if this conversation helped you get a better understanding of yes, this is what I'm looking for. This is my particular goal. Make it known to us because when we create when we create workouts, we are creating workouts for a generic human that may or may not be you. And if it's something where you're like, if we know, because again, this is a small community, we're not doing workout videos for the masses. The masses Maybe or like the, the world. We're but, just focused well, I mean, on surviving. I, I don't even like I don't think anybody that, that creates mass generic workouts is doing anything useful to one individual. They are trying to create it's something that is effective yeah. for a massive amount of people and kind of taking the common denominator amongst them. If you are not considering yourself a common denominator, if there's something more specific that you're trying to get to, you can let us know because we're a small enough community that we can create a workout Absolutely. that for a generic human, but then maybe make a suggestion to you and say like, you might want to do less reps or you might want to do more reps. Yeah. You might want to do more volume and, and do more rounds or you might not. So just like knowing that Paul wants mad jumps, power, powerful jumps. Mad jumps. We will keep that in mind. But if, uh, if anybody out there wants us to help you know, help hold you accountable and be that creative idea. That's what we can do. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know. Yeah. Uh, Paul says that the ultimate thought process is helpful. He appreciates it and gratitude. Oh, is it L O W E? Oh. Did I get his name wrong? Sorry. I Steve, thought it was Lowe. Steve Lowe. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Thank you, it's, Joel. It's an incredible book. And he wrote a second book, I think. Sure. That one's Overcoming Overcoming Mobility. Yeah. I think is, is what his second book is on. Um, he's so <clears throat> smart. He's very smart. Uh, he's amazing. He's really cool. So for the next live stream, we're dabbling with the idea of either parkour or strength class. So if you have thoughts, let us know. We'll keep going. Yep. But we'll see you on Thursday. Whoop whoop. Oh, whole video is good food for thought. I have to think about exactly what my fitness goals are beyond the 12 foot broad jump, of course. <laughs> 12 foot broad jump. <laughs> awesome. That is. Yeah. So that's everybody's homework that for is today. Very specific. Move your body. But if that's what you want, give us adaptation fine. goals. Yeah. That cool. is. That's awesome. That that's specific. Yeah. We could talk about this forever, so we'll be done now. <laughs> we're gonna go. <laughs> we're gonna go eat some dinner. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, you're amazing. We miss you all. We'll see you Thursday, 5:30. I'll update the little bit at the bottom. I think it'll let me. Sometimes it makes me wait. Video renders, but y'all are great. ATP is cool. ATP, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>